The message the Lord has given me, I've entitled it, The Doorway to Healing and to Health. What is the door to healing and to health? Well, it's the mind and the tongue. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh, so is he. As you think, so are you. In Proverbs 18, 21, death and life is in the power of thy tongue. Your tongue. Death and life. So that means that it's important what we think and what we say. Well, you say, I've heard that before, yes? You need to hear it again. <laughs> As we think we are, Jesus said, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. As you think in your heart, so are you, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can be snared by the words of your mouth. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. So it's important what we think and what we say. Not only about healing, but all of life. You know, rattlesnakes have a sack in which they store their venom. It's different with us, different with humans. We don't have any sack to store our venom and poison it. And when you think negative thoughts, thoughts of hate and resentment, when you're confessing sickness and defeat, that poison runs all through your body. Doctors will be the first to tell you that. That poison runs all through your body affecting your well-being and will drive some, if they're not careful, to a premature grave. It's already doing that. Now, James informs us of the same truth in chapter 3 and verse 8 when he says, The tongue is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now, why do you suppose he said that? Because it is full of poison. If you speak the wrong thing, it's just like taking poison. No one will get in the medicine chest and... Not that you would have those things, but to use a figure of speech, get in a medicine chest. Well, that's right. What would you have with a medicine chest in your house, anybody in this church? What they call medicine chests, you call shaving chests. But to use a figure of speech, a medicine chest, no one would get in there and take something out with a skull and crossbones on it. Do they still do that? I haven't been in a drugstore except to buy toothpaste for so long. I don't know. Do they still put skull and crossbones on stuff? Well, how do you know? No one would drink anything out of a bottle that had a skull and crossbones on it. You know, they used to put that on iodine bottles and things. But people will say the worst things. Christians will say the most astounding things and then wonder why they have nothing but sickness and adversity. I mean, you don't have to be a doctor to know why most people, most Christians are always sick. You don't have to be a prophet to predict the future of most people that you'll meet. All you have to do is listen to them. Amen. Listen to the testimony. Listen to what they talk about. Listen to their confession. Amen. Now, Proverbs 23, 7 and 18, 21 shows us there's a close relationship between what we think and what we say. And between what we say and what we experience. And I wonder if you're aware that the Word of God says that what you say will not only affect your present life, but what you're saying is going to affect your future life for all of eternity. People just think, you know, well, that they make a big thing about that, watch your confession. But, dear friends, what you confess, what you talk about, what you testify to, is going to affect your entire life. In Matthew 12 and verse 36, I've got a little proof text for you there, that what you're saying now not only affects you now, your well-being, your health, your finances, your family situation and everything, but what you say is going to affect your future. Matthew 12 and verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word, and if confessing the negative isn't an idle word, I don't know what is, uh, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Words. Your words. You have to watch very carefully what you say. You don't have to be a doctor or prophet to know what's happening and what will happen to people. Just listen to what they say. 
as someone said, and it's quite true, that a lot of people are specialists in sickness and adversity. Because that's all they talk about. They're specialists. Most people are, really. Go in a restaurant. That's one of the things, examples I use all the time because we eat a lot in restaurants. But you go in a restaurant and you get kidney stones, heart trouble, cancer, divorce, business failures, bankruptcy, all with your pancakes or your T-bone steak, whatever you eat. You get it in the booth behind you. You get it in the booth in front of you. And if you ask them, they're probably good church members somewhere. Specialists in sickness and adversity. I mean, they go about looking for trouble, looking for sickness. And you go into their houses, and charismatics I'm including here, you go into their houses and you look in their medicine chest and they've got remedies for every known plague and disease. Because they know eventually they're going to need most of it. It's just a question of time till they do. They usually get all of that stuff that they've got remedies for. <laughs> you know, they ought to know that. That's a fact. If they take a trip, they take a drugstore with them. I'm talking to and about Christians tonight. I told you about the fellow I went to Israel with. We went on a tour. <laughs> I was his roommate, and he had two suitcases, and one he, <laughs> in one he had his clothing, and the other he had his drugstore. Literally a drugstore. Literally a drugstore. And he confessed all the way. He was going to be sick. He's bound to get sick before he got back, and he did. By the time he got to London, he was... Totally bedfast. Another brother and I had to go in and use the authority we had in Christ Jesus to get him home. Now, maybe you don't know you can do that, but we did. We just went in and prayed in spite of his unbelief and his confession so he could get home. He's a Christian. God loved him. He didn't want to leave him over there, so he used our faith to get him home. But <laughs> a drugstore. Now, see, doctors know that much illness is psychosomatic. What you think affects your well-being. Why? Because they know there's certain natural laws that affect your condition, your physical condition. They know it isn't news to learn that worry will cause ulcers, anxiety, cardiac conditions, heart failure, resentment, arthritis, fear, nervousness and tension, chronic nervousness and tension. Why? All because of what he says here in Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life's in the power of thy tongue. See, negative thoughts are destructive. If negative thoughts, as doctors know, can cause an illness, then why couldn't we turn that around and say that positive thoughts based on the Word of God, of course, but even positive thoughts would turn that around and minister health to people. Even non-Christians know some of these truths. They're basic truths. This is the way God's made us. And some people refuse to confess the negative, and they've never heard of the gospel, that is, as far as receiving Christ. And they're not running around defeated and sick all the time. No, you have to go to the church to find the sickness. But if someone has said, and by the way, the reason it'll work is because there's certain unchangeable natural and physical laws, you see, that affect your well-being on the basis of what you think and what you say. Remember the rattlesnake. He has a sack to store his venom. You don't. But we're constantly getting mail, frequently getting mail, constantly is ministerially speaking, frequently getting mail. <laughs> Well, when the Lord quickens that to me, I correct it right away. It's just just hyperbole, constantly, but you're trying to make a point. But frequently we get letters, we get a lot of mail, constantly. <laughs> frequently, though, in that mail, people are praising the Lord for the positive thinking and confession book. Like one, been to psychiatrists galore, no help through a simple prayer of deliverance and this book and this book gets you into the book gets you to confessing the book <laughs> that the life's just completely revolutionized I just had a letter I didn't bring it tonight that I was reading came recently another one how that that God had them in this book just prior to a real trial they were going through and she said the one thing that stuck in my mind when I went through this severe trial and that book got her through it because it got her in the book of books 
the one thing that you said in that book that stuck in my mind that got me through it was that your attitude toward your circumstances or your problem is far more important than the problem itself. It really is. It's your attitude. Your attitude will defeat you. Your attitude will make you sick. One charismatic doctor told me that he believes this and he uses it. He had a patient that was suffering from hypertension and chronic nervousness on tranquilizers and drugs of all kinds. And he just said, I can't help you. This isn't what you need. You're a Christian. Here's what you need to do is confess the word of God. He got her to confessing. He told me this person, he said within two weeks she was back totally cured. You don't get rid of chronic nervousness and hypertension just by imagining it. Especially on all those drugs. It'd make you sick to get off that many drugs right away. And totally cured and said she wanted no more medicine. And it was the confessing the positive word of God that did it. You see, what you think and what you speak is going to affect the way you feel. Not only will it affect your physical well-being, but your whole life. I was preaching in a church on faith, and the pastor, after one of the services, said to me, we were talking, he said, you know, I believe that, what you were teaching about God doesn't want a Christian to be in debt. I must have mentioned Romans 13, 8, and how the God got us out of debt, and there are a lot of people in this church, I know they're out of debt, and a lot are out of debt by faith on their way. And he said, I believe that. said, God showed me that way back before I ever heard of the Holy Spirit in the seminary. He said, he got me out of debt in the seminary, which is a miracle. <laughs> back in those days, I didn't know what it was to be out of debt, and I was walking by faith, you know, according to light I had. And he said, God got me out of debt in the seminary. He said, I went on to be pastor of a large Baptist church and said, that church didn't owe a penny to anybody. And that's a miracle, too, because I don't know of a church that isn't in debt up to its steeple. Yes. <laughs> Um, I should have said the lightning rod on the steeple, <clears throat> which indicates the faith they have in God to protect his investment. But he said, this church totally free from debt, but there was a deacon in there. And praise God for good deacons, but I have met many good ones. And if you are a good one, praise God for you. But... He said there was a deacon in there that insisted when, you know, when they would talk about church, money matters, and so forth, that that's first century economy and that's not for today. And he said, even though God way back in the seminary got me out of debt in this large, great big Baptist church, totally free from debt, he said, I began to listen to that man. And he said, immediately the money stopped coming in and he said, I left that pastorate with a huge debt saddled on it. See, it affects your whole life, just listening. So that's something I want to stress tonight. As much as what you think will affect what you say, listening to what others are saying will affect what you think. And that will affect what you say. That's why we stress in this body, you should be very careful. This morning we said, who you let lay hands on, you should be very careful what you let go into your ear because it affects what you think, that will affect what you say, and what you say is what you get. That is in psychology, that's the word of God. Yes. It's very important. We've got charismatic teachers now teaching that God's healing you while you're on your medicine. They didn't used to teach that, but they're teaching it now. And others who are saying, after they pray for you, and I know of at least two, and I know they're more charismatic, full gospel folk that will pray for people and have anointed ministries. Miracles will happen, and they will insist that they go to the doctor to get a medical confirmation so they can have the assurance in their own heart they're really healed. We want this thing to be confirmed and be genuine. Now, you wouldn't have to think very hard to think of a couple who do that all the time. One recently died, so he, she doesn't do it anymore. <laughs> died of open heart surgery. Mm. That's a whole story in itself. I've got a letter here from a doctor and his wife. <coughs> Charismatic doctor and his wife. Part of a letter. I won't read it all. It's pretty long. This the doctor, the one that we told you about, had the tract that in his office telling Christians you don't need me. <laughs> Points them to the great physician and they think they're so proud of him, they come anyway. Because he's that good Christian doctor. He says they'll drive miles just to come to that good Christian doctor and then he'll point them to Jesus. He doesn't get many converted. Charismatics we're talking about. He doesn't convert many. He has a radio program. He preaches faith. He's giving up medicine for the ministry. 
How about that? No, he means business. And he just can't wait until God takes the shackles off. He's already preaching. He just wants to do it full time. That's another story about how he came into this. You know, we said today these self-professed apostles saying God isn't sovereign. He's one of those like the apostle Paul. God didn't ask Paul, you like get saved today, Paul? I think you ought to repent. God just said you're a chosen vessel. Don't go any farther. Paul stopped, was converted. His wife tells how that, that God just struck him down on the power of the Holy Ghost. She got the Holy Ghost before him, struck him down flat of his back, knocked him out. She said he fell down a skeptic and came up saying the Bible is true, every verse, every word, every line. <laughs> Hallelujah. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I know another doctor went to a meeting to prove tongues were not for today. He knew enough Greek to make up a false tongue. And God just slapped him down and baptized him in the Spirit. And now he's a real testimony that you don't need insurance or medical treatment. He'll treat you so you won't hurt, but you won't cut on him. Well, Lord willing, when we get in the new building, we just may have a whole line of those charismatics up here to let some people learn what it is to trust God when you know all about the body. Some people, you know, have a hard time learning that. Well, here's a part of a letter that I said as preface to all of this, you may have forgotten, that's important who you listen to. Because we've got charismatic teachers now sending you to doctors to get medical confirmation of their prayers. They go themselves. Now here's a doctor and his wife who went to a well-known charismatic meeting in Birmingham, Alabama. I won't mention the evangelist. Well, he comes out of Pentecostalism and Pentecostal, so many of them, I just don't seem to be going anywhere with the faith message. And you wonder how, why and how God can use people with miracle ministries that don't go any deeper. Well, take it up with the Lord. It's just the way it is. In fact, it's too involved to get into. I'll let you figure that out tonight. But they went to this meeting. And at the meeting, and I'm not quoting directly. I just have some excerpts here. At the meeting, people who had been previously healed, the doctor's wife said, were coming again to see if they could be healed again. You know, as if God had done it once, maybe he will do it again. In other words, they don't learn why he healed, to minister faith to them so that they can trust God for themselves. The letter goes on, one of the problems is this brother, this evangelist, and every one of you know him, and he's a dear brother in the Lord, but he's just not going anywhere with anything but like healing and salvation message. One of the problems is this brother works with denominational churches and then refers people that he ministers to back into them, which is a real handicap to the strong word necessary to walk out a miracle. In other words, they get a miracle under his ministry, then he sends them back in these old dead churches. And many of them are charismatic dead churches. And uh, it's a handicap to the strong word they need to be sitting under to walk out that miracle because if symptoms recur, well, they lost their healing or whatever. And he also urges them to return to their physicians for confirmation of a healing, which is feeding them right back to the arm of the flesh so that the next trial requires them to begin all over again. So they run up for another healing every time he comes to town. This is a doctor and his wife talking. The arm of the flesh. He said, we're the arm of the flesh. In one of the services... A brother gave his testimony of healing that he'd received, you know, after prayer in the meeting. And the minister, this evangelist, urged him to go back to his doctor immediately for a confirmation. He would interrupt their testimony. Now go to the doctor, get x-rayed, get a confirmation. How will you know you're healed? By going back and getting an x-ray or whatever, you see. Evangelist is talking this way. We're not talking about non-charismatic. She said, my husband, the charismatic doctor, my husband, when he was saying this to the man, go back and get a medical confirmation. My husband, the doctor, was shaking his head and saying out loud so everybody could hear him. He couldn't help himself. Don't do that. Please, please don't do that. Don't look at the wind and the waves. Keep your eyes on Jesus. (laughs) In this huge meeting that thousands go to and some of you have been to these meetings and come back and tell us about it and so I trust though that you see what's wrong with all of this she said I really thought for a moment he was going to rush up to the platform and preach (laughs) 
really maybe should have. Of course, he feels so strongly because charismatics come to him talking out of both sides of their mouth. You know, believing that God heals, but through the doctor. And he tries to tell a Christian, you don't need me, you need faith in the word of God. And she said, by the way, he's never had an unregenerate person walking out screaming and slamming the doors, did one charismatic woman that he gently told if she really believed what she said, that she was healed, she wouldn't be in his office. (laughs) And she just exploded and took off. Well, she goes on to say that so much attention in that meeting was focused on the anointed evangelist, and he is anointed on the anointed evangelist and outward manifestations and upon getting medical confirmation that it actually worked against faith. That the meeting itself was working against God's purpose, which is always faith. Well, we've said that before. How many times have you heard me say it in one way or another that most charismatics and a lot of you, I've seen you do it, you'll watch a miracle taking place and then your eyes will shift to see what God's going to do to the next person. And thought would never enter some of your minds of why somebody got healed or got delivered or received the Holy Ghost or got a miracle. That wasn't an end in itself. That was to point them to Jesus to go all the way with him. (laughs) Healing is never an end in itself. Isn't it amazing that a doctor and his wife can see this? I'm always blessed by their letters. You can see why. Well, she said that we left the convention a day early, disappointed, saying that those of us who have been blessed with the faith message sometimes lose sight of where most of God's people really are. Most of us who have the faith message lose sight of where most of God's people really are. You sit under a strong ministry of faith like we have here and in the meetings where this ministry goes out. You sit under a strong message of faith and then you go to some charismatic meetings. You go to some charismatic meetings and you'll weep, you'll weep at the lack of biblical faith and how they encourage people to rely on the arm of the flesh and man and doctors and insurance companies. And well, as I've said, they get up and confess they're going to faint before they get through. And I generally try to move out of the way because if I'm the speaker, I'm pretty close to the platform. The things they say. Now, such teaching that went on in that huge charismatic meeting, and he has a worldwide ministry, such teaching is not coming out of non-charismatic circles, teaching that God is healing you on your medicine and through surgery, and you should go get medical confirmation to make sure you're healed. That isn't coming out of denominational churches. That's coming out of charismatic circles. You would expect that from people who don't know the faith message or who reject the end time move of God and divine healing and miracles. I was reading a book the other day by one of these well-meaning teachers, non-charismatic about healing. You would expect to read something like this. I have a little quotation jotted down here. He was teaching us on James 5, healing in the prayer of faith. Now listen to this man. You would expect this from him, but not charismatics. First, the oil. He's going to teach us about the oil. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with oil, him with oil. In the name of the Lord, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. The Lord will raise him up. So he said, first, the oil. He says, this was the common remedial agent in those days when medical science was still in its infancy. That was was the medicine, the oil. He said, and the word anoint here in James, the way James used the word anoint, the term anoint as it's used in this passage meant to massage. (laughs) Let them anoint him with oil in the name of God. He says that meant to massage. Therefore, James was not saying medical help was unnecessary. To the contrary, he said to get the best. And massaging with oil was the best medical help available in those days. Oh, I don't know where to cry or to laugh. Oh, that's pathetic. And you know, I, it's a mystery to me how you could massage a broken bone. <laughs> how would you massage with oil a blind eye? He said that was the best medical treatment. That's all they had. 
And James was saying, get the best. Use oil and massage that diabetic. <laughs> massage that cancer of the liver. I don't know how you're going to get in there to get to those officers either. They don't even think of what they're saying. James 5 tells you what to do. Anoint them with oil. Massage with oil. Well, if it really, if that was the way it was, then it ought to work today. Why all of a sudden doesn't it work today? No, they don't stock oil in drugstores. You have to go to filling stations to get oil. <laughs> or, or grocery stores. Now, we would expect that from non-charismatics, but to hear a man with a tremendous ministry like this man has break a doctor's heart to where he had to get up and leave by telling people to go see him and he's saying, no, don't do that. Point them to Jesus. I wonder what people sitting around him must have thought. They probably thought, but they didn't know he was a doctor. If they thought he was a doctor, they thought he was a doctor that needed doctoring, probably. <laughs> Because charismatics don't understand what we're talking about. Most don't. Now, we tell it like it is. That doesn't mean you shouldn't pray for them. But you're seeing what happens when man's logic and intellect comes in contact with the Word of God. Because, see, you don't believe anything with your head. Remember we said with the heart. And what this man has said here about the term oil and anointing mean massage and all that and what charismatics are saying that God heals you on medicine as if he needs that and sending people to the doctors to get medical confirmation when doctor said to his nurse who broke her finger and she claimed because she had heard the faith message and she went on and acted her faith and was typing that the devil got talking to her now you just keep pounding that finger you'll get it so it'll never set or heal she wasn't having been a problem no pain or anything else so she went to the charismatic doctor, a friend of ours, and said, Should I be doing that? She said, The x-ray shows it's broken. And he took the x-ray. Well, he said, Which are you going to believe? The x-ray or the word of God? Thank God for people like that. I guess eventually they would all get out of medicine if they went all the way on this. But I'm not standing here criticizing them. I thank God they're taking a stand themselves for divine healing and have no confidence in their own remedies. They have no confidence because they're not treating themselves. But this is what happens, as I said, all of this teaching by charismatics and non-charismatics, when man's intellect comes in contact with revelation, with the word of God, with the message of faith, with the promises of God. You see, the first lesson you ought to learn, the first thing you should be taught, really, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that the things of God, the word of God, his word, the promises of God, are all matters of faith. And if you approach the word of God and the promises of God, with your intellect, you'll end up where a non-charismatic does. That is to say, if a spirit-filled Christian comes to the word of God and the promises of God, which have to be dealt with by faith, with his intellect and reason, he'll end up the same place the non-charismatic does in the fleshly reasonings of his mind. That's why you've got so many charismatics that sound like non-charismatics in the area of faith. Even those who teach faith, many of them. Because they're approaching the unapproachable with their mind and intellect that can only be approached with faith. There's no difference in the final analysis, in a non-charismatic saying, I believe that God heals, but I believe he does it through doctors and sometimes supernaturally. No difference in him saying that than a charismatic saying, I believe God heals two ways, supernaturally and through the doctors and medicines. There's no difference in the final analysis in a non-charismatic saying, I believe that God heals, but I believe he does it through doctors and sometimes supernaturally. No difference in him saying that than a charismatic saying, I believe God heals two ways, supernaturally and through the doctors and medicines. And you know which one they rely on when they say that. You know which one they rely on 99% of the time when they say that. I mean... Faith teachers who are teaching us now that God heals you while you're on the pills, and they're trying to give examples of people who got healed that way, telling you to go get medical confirmation of a healing that the Word of God isn't sufficient. Because God says you are. They've lost the uniqueness of their message. They have. 
And if they are right, you listen carefully, dear friend. If they are right, Jesus paid a terrible price for nothing. <laughs> My heart grieves for men that I know that ought not to be saying what they're saying. And I do pray for them. If they are right that God heals you on medicine with surgery, Jesus paid a terrible price at Calvary for nothing. Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5 says that surely he has borne our diseases and carried our pains. It doesn't say surely he's borne our sicknesses and diseases through the doctors. He didn't bear them through the doctors and through surgery. He didn't bear our pains 2,000 years later. You know, it was just maybe relatively recently they've discovered painkillers. People used to have legs cut off by being knocked out or something. Isaiah 53 says he bore pains at Calvary. Now we're going to wait 2,000 years until God reveals to medical science some miracle drugs that put us to sleep so they can chop us up, mutilate us. My Bible doesn't say that. It says, surely he bore away those diseases and carried away those pains. And with his stripes, not medical science and drugs, but with his stripes were healed. He paid a price. I'm not going to rob him of his glory. I'm not going to rob him of his work. I mean it with all my heart. If everybody got up and walked out and said, you are a religious nut, I'd stand here and preach it to the walls and ceiling that by his stripes I'm healed. That surely he bore the disease and the pain. And I'm not going to give any glory to medical science or medical drugs or whatever. And you're saying, well, that's easy to say. But what if? Well, that's what you said. I never say what if. That isn't faith. But I have had the trials, friends. I'm standing before you because I believe the word of God. The enemy put two heart attacks on me. The first one, I didn't know what to do but scream for the doctor because it was non-charismatic. All I knew is what Baptists do. Scream for the doctor. Methodists and Lutherans too. But by the time he tried to put a second one on me, it was a ten-minute trial, not months like the other one. Ten minutes. But I knew what to do then. I had the Word of God. I had seen in the Word that by His stripes I'm healed. He had borne my diseases. And that terrible pain I experienced for about ten minutes, I couldn't. No way. He bore it. How could it be on both of us? I'm not going to rob Him of His glory. You know, it makes you wonder sometimes what version of the Bible these men are reading. To come up with such completely contrary contradictions to the word of God on divine healing. And they say they believe in it. Makes you wonder what version they're reading. The hours arrived. We keep saying things like this. And we're going to keep repeating it. The hours arrived when you've got to make a choice between the word of God and the word of charismatic men. I used to say men. I say charismatic men now. It's your responsibility to make the choice. That isn't a blanket charge against all charismatic men. In fact, we know some that go all the way with the Lord. All the way. But I'll tell you, just because the word charismatic is used doesn't mean that that makes it valid. Because if you get somebody ministering to your old flesh and to your intellect... And he's charismatic. There's a real temptation, you see, to follow that person and not Hobart Freeman or someone else. Like one brother wrote in his letter, said, I was sitting under these tremendous faith teachers. And they have been. And I trust God will deliver them from their errors in this area and some other areas. About Jesus dying spiritually. But he said, it was a great temptation. I was walking out of healing by faith on the basis of the word of God. A great temptation to do what they were saying. Get back on the arm of the flesh and trust it and wait for the manifestation that way. It's a great temptation. I mean, when one of the healing evangelists of this country doesn't show up for a meeting because he's under the doctor's care while we're all waiting there for him to teach us on healing, and I'm just new in this and have recently suffered that first heart attack and then got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and symptoms recur, oh my, you better have something based on more than that man's testimony or his word, the word of God, or they can shake you right to the bottom of your shoes shake you out of your faith. And they do shake the faith of people. And God helped them on Judgment Day. I mean, you have the obligation to forsake the word of every man 
if it isn't 100% in line with the Word of God. Oh, but so-and-so believes in healing. People will reply to you. And God gives me grace not to reply right back till they're finished. Oh, he believes in healing. He prays for the sick in his meetings. Yes, he believes in healing, but does he believe in divine healing? Or in healing through the instrumentality of drugs and doctors and hospitals? Now, we don't apologize for what we're saying here. You may be new. It may be your first or second trip. I don't know. But we think here it's ludicrous for a Christian to think God needs anything but faith in the blood of Jesus to heal you. Ludicrous for you to think he needs someone to cut you up and mutilate you. To cut out a kidney. Mutilation. When his word says restoration. When Jesus bore your diseases and pains. So you've got to choose between people who believe in healing and people who believe in divine healing. And I don't mind citing a case I mentioned here some time ago about a brother that I have ministered in the church that they are involved with charismatic work. He's a big, big car dealer. He said to one of the leading healing evangelists, who's a close friend of his, he was telling me this when I was out there ministering once. He said, I really shook him up. Now, he's one of the leading healing evangelists. Hundreds of thousands have been healed under his ministry. He said, brother, it's too bad we don't agree. He said, I told him this last time I was out there. Well, he said, what's the matter? I thought we agreed on everything. Well, he said, I believe in divine healing and you don't. Now, here's an automobile dealer telling one of the leading healing evangelists, I believe in divine healing. You don't. Well, he said, what in the world are you talking about? That's my ministry. Prayed for tens of thousands. Well, he says, you don't believe in divine healing. You believe in healing, but not divine healing. Because if you don't get them healed, you tell them to go to the doctors. You know, don't do anything foolish. In fact, he says, you go yourself. He's the one who didn't show up to the 5,000 people waiting for him, by the way, because he had flu symptoms and under doctor's care. He said, no, we don't agree. So, yes, he believes in healing. He's prayed for tens of thousands of people. Certainly does. But there's a difference in divine healing. And divine healing is Isaiah 53 and Matthew 8, 16 and 17, where Isaiah said he bore our diseases and our pains. Matthew 8, 16 and 17 says himself bare sicknesses. And carried away the diseases. And he quotes Isaiah. His prophecy. Mark 16. These signs will follow them believe. Believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. James 5. The prayer of faith will heal the sick. The hours arrive when you've got to choose between the word of Mark and James and the word of Tom, Dick and Harry. Because you don't have, you don't have any other option. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry is telling you what the Bible means. Why don't you just believe the Word of God? Amen. Jesus said the door to healing is your mind and your tongue. The Word of God makes it plain. Not only is it revealed what you're thinking, but what you say, but what you're thinking and what you say affects your well-being. But we're saying that what others are saying, if you listen to them, it can affect what you think, which will affect what you say. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 4, take heed what you hear. That's a warning he gives in Mark 4, 24. Take heed what you hear. Now, why would he say that? Because it affects what you think, that affects what you say, and that's what you'll get. He said in another place, take heed and beware of the teaching of the religious leaders. He warned them against listening to the doctrine of the Pharisees. And people think you've lost your mind when you say, be careful what charismatic teachers you listen to. Like we're trying to build a following around us where we'd already have an organization over this country. We could have had it. I'm not trying to build anything. Anytime God says, give the ministry to anybody in this body, you'll have it and I'll sit there with a pencil and notebook and a Bible. We're not trying to build anything. Friends, I mean that with all my heart. What advantage is it to me to have people following me when on the day of judgment I've got to give an account of what I did with this ministry and his flock? It isn't mine. So when I tell you, be careful who you listen to, I can't 
follow you around and see what you read and who you listen to. I expect you to use some discernment. That's what we're saying. Jesus warned, take heed what you hear. Don't listen, he said, to the teaching of the Pharisees. So you've got to choose, he's saying, between faith in what I tell you and the vain reasonings of man. You want to know why that's important, who you listen to? And it's because you've got to choose between faith, which is ministered by the word of God, and the vain reasonings of man's intellect. I don't care if it is charismatic intellect a lot of times. Because faith alone is going to get you through. Faith will take you into realms where your mind, your intellect can never go. You'll never get through some of those trials with reason and intellect and medical knowledge. The devil will put something on you nothing but faith can see you through. And God never gave man an intellect or a mind or reason to take him into realms where only faith is permitted to go. Where only faith can go. You say, where is that? In his word. In the spiritual realm. In the realm where all the promises are transacted. Mark eleven twenty four. When you pray, believe you have received before you see it and you shall have it. When you pray, not when you feel better, not when the money comes, not when the loved ones say. See, faith will take you into realms where your intellect can never follow in a thousand years. It isn't designed for that. God never designed your mind, your reason, intellect, medical knowledge to do what only faith can do. Take you into realms where only faith can go. And so it's like it is in everything that God offers us. Salvation, you know, isn't a matter of reason. It's a matter of faith. You can't explain it. It just happens. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The whole Christian walk is a matter of faith. Mark eleven twenty four tells me something. I've said in a lot of ways, but the Lord gave it to me this week this way, that God did not promise us anything that we could see we had it before we believed we had it. <laughs> That's Mark eleven twenty four. He's saying there, I don't promise you a thing that you can see you have before you believe you have it. I had to feel ridiculous and foolish Speaking in tongues without any anointing because God required me to act my faith. I said, I'll do everything but that to get the baptism. And he said, that's the way you're going to get it. See, the Holy Spirit controls the tongue in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of new tongues. And if you say with your tongue you won't do something. Or you don't see this or that. If you ever get it, you're going to go that route. Just most of the time anyway. So I had to feel foolish for a while, and I certainly did. But he didn't promise to give me anything. to give me the baptism of the Holy Spirit that I could experience an anointing or feeling or whatever before acting my faith. I had to move out in faith. I mean, I had to walk out a heart condition by faith for several months that first time with some recurring symptoms until God manifested it in the feeling realm, the sense realm. He doesn't promise you anything that you can reason out or feel. Faith takes you into realms where you see your feeling, your senses, your intellect can never go. Well, we're going somewhere with what we're saying tonight and you pray God he'll get it down into your spirit because this will save you a lot of questions and anxiety and worry later. I had to take a plane to New York before I got the money I'd claimed to go to Israel. It wasn't in Claypool, it was in New York. I had to close a business, go off to college, 32 years of age, with $450 in my pocket and an old car that couldn't run a thousand miles, and a family to feed before God can manifest Matthew 6.33 on my behalf, which he did and has done for 25 years. Never failed, never missed a meal. And a long time had no income. Say, how did he do it? I don't know. Don't know. Don't know yet how cars run without gas either God has not promised to do a thing for you that you can know you have it that is see you have it feel you have it before you believe you have it because he said so why the scriptures say we walk by faith and not by sight well I appreciate your amens but sometimes we get amens and then questions later if you're saying amen and no questions or strings attached that's fine because faith never questions I have to say that Dear friends, because I, as pastor, have to minister the people that do say amen and shake their head and agree with you. And, and then in time of trial, 
like Thomas, I'm not going to believe. Or how can I believe until I see? I mean, praise God for the amens. I'm not saying don't say amen, but I'm saying faith isn't an amen. And amen results from faith. Faith's an attitude. Faith's an experience. Faith never raises a question about the delay or their symptoms or the circumstances getting worse. And some of you have, bless your hearts. Faith doesn't. Faith and attitude is an experience and the inward awareness you have already received. And if you open your mouth, it's a positive testimony. Here's what God has done. His word says so. It's not what should I do. If you don't know what to do, I encourage you to ask. We'll get you in the word. I'm not saying that. But we don't have to keep repeating what we're not saying. How can you know when it's faith? Well, right away, most people are going to say, when I believe the word of God, I'll know it's faith and not hope. That's when, that's when it's faith. When you know you believe the word of God. Well, that's a good place to start. And that's as good as far as it goes. <laughs> but if that's as far as it goes, it didn't go far enough. Because a lot of people start out that way. They believe the promise of God and then somewhere along the way they fizzle out. As D.L. Moody said, faith that fizzles out at the finish had a flaw in it from the first. Fizzles out along the way. That's good. That's where faith starts, believing the word of God. But that isn't faith. That's just where it starts. Faith is believing you have received when you pray because his word says you have. Before you see it. Before you feel it. Mark eleven twenty four is just one of the places he tells you that. Because you see, if you just say, well, I know it's faith because I believe, then that's believism. That's good as far as it goes. It doesn't go far enough. If that's as far as it goes, it isn't far enough. Because then it may be head faith and not heart faith. And head faith is often as sincere and confident even as heart faith. It's just in the wrong location to receive anything from God. <clears throat> Romans ten ten. you believe with the heart. He says... With the heart, not the head. Not the little physical heart, but the inward being, the inner man. You say, you're aware, and you say, I know I have received. And because you know you have received, then like Peter, you walk on the water, you act your faith. Like Abraham, you go for 25 years, if need be, saying God is faithful, God is true. In spite of all medical evidence to the contrary, Abraham said, I have a son because God said so. Faith isn't just believing, it starts there. And it shouldn't stop there, and it often does with charismatics. But faith only starts with believing, and then it's to go on and act out its faith. Because, well, faith is like dropping a letter in a mailbox. You order something, $300. You're so confident you put the $300 check in the mail and send it off to New York and you rest, you forget about it until there's a knock on the door and UPS or whatever and there's your package. You don't sit up nights worrying like you do about whether God's going to answer a promise or not or getting advice from the pastor or a sister in the church. Will you prophesy over me or see if the Lord will show you something or intercede or whatever? We know that... Hobart isn't going to stand here for an hour and talk about intercession has its place and all that. But you drop your letter in the box. And you don't stay up all night there watching that box, see if the mail truck will come and pick it up. And then get in your car and follow the truck all the way to New York. And then go into the office and stand there with your arms folded, see when they're going to open your letter and fill your order and go back in the mail delivery room and then follow the package home. No, you have perfect confidence, no doubt. You drop it in there and you hear the thing go clickety-clack and you get back in your car. You were so confident you sent 300 of your hard-earned dollars. That's what faith is. When it's faith is when you are acting like you believe it's faith. Isn't it strange they will trust the word of Sears more than the word of God? They will trust the mail service more than God to deliver it. I'm talking to you, dear friends, and people who hear this tape. Well, sometimes Christians with their skepticals on will reply to our <laughs> faith message. Say, our faith message that says, faith is acting on your faith before you see the manifestation. It's acting like you believe. It's doing all you're supposed to do or whatever God requires. They say, but that's blind faith. I don't believe in blind faith. 
Well, I don't believe in blind faith either, because blind faith implies that the only basis for your believing you'll receive is just sheer determination in the hope that if you pray hard enough and fast long enough and beg long enough and plead, you know, like sending up a lot of trial balloons, that maybe he'll reach out and pick yours out and it'll have your name on it. Let's answer John Doe's prayer today. Hey, it looks pretty serious. Why, he's been fasting a week. Guy's probably hungry by now. (laughs) He really has need because, why, he's been praying as much as 45 minutes at a stretch. No, faith isn't any of that. Well, we draw a picture that's a little ludicrous, yes, but that's just where they are. If you could just walk into their situation and follow them around for a week, the way they're begging and pleading as sons of God for God to give them what he's already given them as joint heirs, instead of claiming their inheritance and walking on to work and walking it out by faith or whatever, they go to bed to see if they'll get any better or whatever. So they'll say, I don't believe in blind faith. Well, I don't either because my faith is based upon something more than determination or hope. But on the unchanging promises of God. Amen. Amen. Oh, it's easy to do, as some charismatics are telling us. It's easy to have confidence in what you can see and feel as long as you're getting the shots and taking the pills. That's easy. But that isn't faith. I'm going to tell you something before I stop here tonight. And that is... That the word of God says that Christians walk by faith and not by sight. The word of God says Christians, Christians, Christians walk by faith and not by sight. That that which is not of faith displeases God. That which is not of faith is sin. And without faith it's impossible to please God. My Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith. And not by sight. Now where does that leave the Christians with their skepticals on who criticize those of us who teach faith? My Bible says Christians walk by faith and not by sight. Now, there's no way for you, Christian, to get around the fact this Bible is filled with promises purchased at Calvary. He isn't limiting that to John 3.16. I just read an article by a professor in seminary where I used to teach. On Hebrews 11.1, 1, I thought, well, maybe God's given him some light. The whole thing was John 3.16. Faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We don't see Jesus, and so Christians have faith that he exists and all of that. It's just John 3.16 all over. As if God had never said anything else in his word. He's also one that let his wife die and not let another professor who also taught in the seminary and charismatic pray for his wife. Because that isn't for today. He's already ruled out the miraculous. I don't know what version they're reading for that. But what you think affects what you say, and what you say affects your life, your whole experience, your well-being. Be careful what you say. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The Lord bless thee, the Lord keep thee, the Lord make his face to shine on thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up His countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The Lord bless thee, the Lord keep thee, the Lord make His face to shine on thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up His countenance upon thee and give thee
Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee 